Okay, we're back on the record. It's uh, 10 22 a.m. Mr. Schwentz, I know we just took a, took a break, and I think you've had an opportunity to review what we've marked as exhibit number three. Correct. And I guess you identified that as the, the application for insurance that you would have completed. Correct. And it, I guess is this in your handwriting? Yes, it is. And starting out on the first page, it's got a section for proposed insured information, uh, and it's pretty, I guess, self-explanatory name, date of birth, social security number, height, weight, marital status. Is that all information that you would typically take? Correct. And did you always do this in your own handwriting? Yes. This information, I believe you testified earlier, you got this from the insured's sister. Correct. Is that something you would normally do when you're taking an application for life insurance? Well, the norm would be to get it from the insured or proposed insured, uh, but it isn't unusual to have someone else own the policy. Okay. And, and I know we'll get to that in a second. I know that someone else can be the owner of the policy, but as far as you're actually taking the application and getting this information to put on the form, is it your testimony it's more routine for you to get that from the insured themselves? Correct. And have you ever taken an application for insurance where you got the information from just the owner? I don't recall at this point with the other life or or uh, health policies that I, I wrote. Okay. And I, I guess to clarify, there were times when I would write a health policy, if you want to talk about the health end of it, as opposed to the life where I would sit down with a husband or a wife, but the health policy was written for both of them. Okay. I, th I think let's just, to keep it simpler, keep this limited just to life to, to insurance. Life. Okay. About how many life applications do you think you procured during Judge, your lifetime? Ask and answer. It's in the neighborhood of 10. Okay, and I'm sorry, I'll clarify that. I guess while you worked for Midwest, mm -hmm. I know you told me that you'd been licensed back in the 60s, in the 70s? No, in the, in, the, in the late 50s. No, I mean the early 60s. Early right? 60s, right. okay. And so, I mean, you've got experience in insurance dating back. Well, I, can you say that, with, that I have experience in it? If I did it in the, the uh, early 60s and then I went 40-something years before I did it again. So, I mean, there was an ongoing experience in life and health insurance during that period of time. Okay. I, and I, we didn't get into that. I, we didn't go that far back. Right. And, and I guess your employment, and we, and we can. When, I guess, what was the first insurance company you ever worked for? Oh, Lord. Um, I can't remember the name of it, and I only worked for, I only worked for them for three or four months before I then went into the paper industry. Okay. And I guess this was, you say, the early 60s? Mm-hmm. And were you writing life policies or health it was, policies? It was life. Okay. And where were you, I guess, were you in Florida? Yeah, Jacksonville, time? Florida. Okay. Is that where you grew up originally? Correct. And I guess, were you going to school at the time? No. Okay. You had already gotten out of school? Correct. Okay. And how long did you work for this insurance company? Three or four months. And how many life policies do you think? Just one or two. Okay. And then after that, I guess, what line of work did you go into? Wholesale paper distribution. And who was that? Who you employed with? I started with what was called Jacksonville Paper Company at the time, later became Unijax, later was sold to Unisor what is now Unisource. And how long did you work for them? I worked for them for 24 years. Then I went to work for Distribix out of the Midwest uh, and worked for them for six years. They were also bought out by Unisource. 
And then I went to work for Athens Paper Company in Memphis, Tennessee, and worked for them for six years. So a total of 36 years in wholesale paper distribution up until now getting back into it. Okay. I guess, did you move from Jacksonville to, I guess, did you say the Midwest? No, I, I started in Jacksonville and then went to Charleston, South Carolina, and then Savannah, Georgia, and then Tallahassee, Florida, and then back to Jacksonville, and then to Decatur, Illinois, and then to Little Rock, Arkansas, and then to Memphis, Tennessee. The last page of this application, it looks like the application was dated May the 2nd, 2005. Correct. It, was this the last application for life insurance that you wrote for Midwest? Yes. When this particular policy was canceled, did you get, I guess, a chargeback notice from Midwest? No, because I was, at that point, was no longer with them, uh, and I would have gotten no correspondence from them. They were no longer paying me uh, anything. This, I'm sure, would have been part of, uh, well, let me back up. I don't know that there would have been a charge back because a claim was put in on that policy. You know, they would have stopped, stopped paying commission on it, but I don't know how that would work as far as an advance that I was paid. If, if there was money that was owed, it would have been part of that uh, roughly $3,400 that they uh, said I, I owed them. What, if any, understanding do you have about the importance of information on these forms being accurate? It is vitally important for the uh, underwriters to be able to make a determination of uh, issuing a policy. And I guess you knew that at the time that this application was taken? I did. And I, I guess is that why it's, it's preferred that you get this information from the actual insured themselves? Objection form. It's, it's preferred, but as long as the owner of the policy can honestly answer the questions, there is not a problem with the owner of the policy answering the questions. And by honestly answering the questions, tell me, can you elaborate on that? Normally what I would do when I would get to page two of this, the, the health questions, and I can't remember verbatim exactly what I would have said to Delaney and Nichols, but normally I would say, we've got a series of questions here. I'm going to ask you each one of them, and I want you to give me an answer to the best of your knowledge. Okay. Which would be fairly standard of how you would, would phrase that. Even if it was the, applica the, uh, the insured answering these questions, I would say the same thing. I want you to answer these questions to the best of your knowledge. Okay. You say you said that you would do that, I guess, on the, the health questions on the second page. What about the questions on the first page? Before I would start the application, uh, if it was a situation like this where it was the owner of the policy, that uh, will you be able to answer all the questions, uh, in this case, for your brother? In other words, I needed to know she would have the social security number and the date of birth and a driver's license if he had one and how much he weighed and all that. Okay. Now, you said driver's license. I guess is that something you would get from... Yeah, because see, one of the questions is driver's license. And this driver's license number, in this case, he didn't have a driver's license. I've got none written down there. But if he had a driver's license, I would need to have that number. So if... 
if he had a driver's license and she didn't have the number, we would have had to have gotten that number somehow, whether she called them or whatever. So I guess by your indicating on there none, that your understanding was he did not have a driver's license. When I asked what is the driver's license number, she would have stated he doesn't have a driver's license. And I guess is that normal in your experience taking life or life insurance applications that a proposed insurer didn't have a, a driver's license? That is not normal, no. <coughs> the next section, uh, the first question is, has any proposed insured used any tobacco or nicotine products within the last 12 months? And the box is, is checked no. I guess you got that information from Delaney Nichols? Correct. And is that something you normally would expect someone other than the insured to be able to answer? Yes. If they say they could answer the question, I would. So I guess, like, in, in your case, I don't know if you smoke or not. I don't. I guess, could your wife answer that question on? Oh, yes. In regards to you, she knows whether or not in the last 12 Absolutely. months you've smoked. Absolutely. So at the time you took this application, you didn't have any reason to think that Delania could not answer that question truthfully? That's correct. What impact does that, I guess, have on an application for insurance, whether somebody smokes or not? If they smoke, there would the premium would be higher. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean they wouldn't get insurance. It's just that it would cost them more. Correct. That's the point. If you could elaborate on that, I mean, in your experience, is is that pretty standard that someone that smokes is going to pay more than someone that does not? Yes, because when you're putting together the premium for them, and it was done with a computer, and one of the questions that it would ask me from the computer was, does the applicant smoke? If I put yes in there, whether it was health or life, it's going to increase the amount of the premium. So you would actually have a laptop with you? Correct. When you were there meeting with, I guess, the insured or the applicant? Correct. And would you go through these questions on the computer as well? No. You just did that just to figure what the premiums would be? Correct. That question asks tobacco or nicotine products, and I know I asked you earlier if you if you smoked, and I guess we both assume cigarettes, but you know people smoke pipes and smoke cigars and, and other things as well. They use smokeless tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use any of those products? No. Have you ever? No. The next section asks, within the past five years, and the first subpart is, have you had three or more moving violations or had your license suspended or revoked? And I guess when you're taking this application, do you ask, do you read these questions to yes, I do. the person? And I know, I know that I just read it. It said, within the past five years, have you had three or more moving violations? I guess, what's your understanding of the you? The you is the, uh, the proposed insured. Okay. And so in this case... Antonio be, Nichols. Antonio Nichols. Correct. Not Delaney and Nichols. That's correct. Now, do you have independent recollection of whether or not she understood 
but that's what you were asking that you weren't asking her these questions that you were asking her objection these questions for mr. Nichols speculation to my knowledge she would have understood that because she was going to be the owner of the policy and I was asking questions about her brother and every question needed to be answered for her brother okay. there are other I guess sections in here the, the owner's name and the beneficiary's name it looks like the beneficiary is Diane Nichols I guess it's got relationship with the mother and that's on us correct and, I, and I'm just I'm just moving down the page yeah, that's the okay. next section and then the next one is owners correct and it says in here unless otherwise noted the owner will be the insured correct and it's got the owner is Delaney and Nichols correct Explain to me, if you would, what's the difference between the owner and the insured? Why is there a, a... The owner of the policy would be the person that is going to pay the premiums on that policy. Okay. In this case, Delania Nichols was paying the premiums for her brother. She, therefore, became the owner of the policy if it was issued. Okay. And I guess the owner is the one that can determine who the beneficiary is? Correct. And I guess, did you know who Diane Nichols was at the time? Do you remember if she was there in the home? I don't know if she was there during my taking the application. I had met her previously because she is the one that stated to uh, Delania that your brother doesn't have any life insurance, you may want to consider getting a life insurance policy for him. Back, I guess, in the section about the tobacco or nicotine products, I think your testimony was you used a laptop, and depending on how they answer that question, it would affect the amount of the premium. Correct. And then the next section, within the past five years, have you had three or more moving violations or have you been convicted of or awaiting trial for reckless driving, DUI or any other drugs or felony? I guess any person that answered yes to those, would that affect their premium as well? Just I, don't, vague. I don't know. In other words, I, there was nothing in my computer to put something like that in there. The, the tobacco, yes, but this other, no. It could affect the policy from an underwriting standpoint, but I would not have been involved in that. I would need to then get them the information if it, it was answered yes uh, on that. And so my understanding is as far as the what the policy amount, the premium Correct. per year, I guess the you either had quotes for smokers or non-smokers. Correct. Did you ever write any life insurance where the premium was adjusted as a result of the underwriters? Yes. And can you elaborate on that? Do you know what the circumstances were with that? I don't know exactly why one would be rated up. Uh, normally it would be for smoking or not smoking or a health related issue. And I know we're going to get to that in a second, but I guess what you're saying is if someone had, had checked on the next page that they had, uh, you know, a blood disorder or something like that, mm -hmm. that that might affect the premium that you had quoted them. Correct. For, now, if we're, again, we want to keep this just to life insurance. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And I guess for health insurance, though, would that... Well, for health insurance, if... Because with health insurance, I would start the application with this page. And the reason I would do that is if they said they had diabetes, I would stop the process right then because I would know no policy would be issued. Okay. So I always started with that because if anything came up here that I knew would prevent it from being issued, there was no point in me putting an application in. Okay. 
What about for life policies? Were there any instances like that, say diabetes or uh, respiratory disorder, that you just knew right from the start? With life, I don't, I don't know of anything, if it had been answered yes here, that would have prevented a policy from being issued. It would probably have been rated up as opposed to a health policy. If they have diabetes, they know there's going to be a lot of claims going against that health policy. Diabetes isn't necessarily going to cause someone to die. And I guess in, in, in simple terms, and I think you and I have got a really firm grasp on it, but just so we're on the same page, life insurance in essence is a bet. Would you agree with that? Objection mm -hmm. form. Yes. It's, it's, it's a wager. It's mm -hmm. the insurance company is betting you're not going to die. Right. And the, I guess the insured or the owner of the policy is betting that they will. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far because I would hate to think somebody would be betting that they would die. <laughs> right. But that's essentially, though, Correct. what it is. And mm -hmm. this application, I guess, is for the insurance company to evaluate that risk. Correct. And you agree with me, then, all these questions, they need to be as accurate as possible. Absolutely. Did you know that the insurance company had rescinded this policy? No. Do you know now that they rescinded this policy? I'm assuming they did, but I don't know that for a fact, no. Okay. Mr. Swinson, have you ever seen that document before? No, I haven't. Let's mark that for ID purposes as the next exhibit. Mr. Swinson, can you tell me what that what it appears to be? Well, it appears to be a memo explaining why they would not have issued the policy had they known the following reasons. And I guess what was, when you're saying they, that's from Midwest? From Midwest, correct. And I, I guess what are the reasons that they've got cited there? Well, number one, it says question A on page one of application should have been answered yes. That's the one about the smoking. Two. 72402 applicant charged with reckless driving, driving while license suspended, revoked, canceled, or speeding. That would have gone to have B. And I, I, I'm sorry, I wanted to say, I guess A, a and B, I didn't know that, that the question with smoking was delineated like that. I don't understand what you're asking or saying. Objection. Question. Yeah, I mean, is it, it with, with that memo, are they saying that the that the smoking should have been checked as? As question A on page one of the application should have been answered yes. The only A I see is have you, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I, I did, I'm, I'm looking at it wrong. A is have you had three or more moving violations or had your license suspended or revoked? That's the A they're talking about and they say that should have been answered yes. And then they go on to say 724 applicant charged with reckless driving, driving while license suspended, revoked, canceled, or speeding. 
227.03, driving under influence of intoxicants, drugs, public intoxication, driving while license suspended, revoked, canceled, reckless driving. So they're everything is on, on uh, I guess, on A. And, that, and that's the one, I guess, that has, have you had three or more moving violations? Correct. Now, I guess, what, in, what's your understanding of a moving violation? A uh, violation while you're driving uh, an automobile. Okay. And then, or had your license suspended or revoked, I guess the, that's a driver's license, I'm assuming. Is that what your understanding of it is? Well, I need to go back a second because A says, have you had three or more moving violations or had your license, okay, or suspended, okay, because there were only two violations listed here, but one of them was driving on a suspended license. Now, what was the question that you asked me? Okay, I was, I was trying to get into those terms, moving violations, and then also the term license. Mm -hmm. And I guess you and I both were assuming that that has to do with, with driving an automobile, but it, it doesn't say anything in there about driving. Would you agree with that? Correct. I, and I guess as, as an insurance, uh, a person that's licensed with the state of Tennessee at the time, mm -hmm. if I asked you if your license had ever been suspended or revoked, mm -hmm. I guess I could mean your driver's license or I could mean your insurance license. Do you agree with that? I, yeah, that, that, that's true. If somebody asked me if my license was revoked uh, and we were talking about uh, health or life insurance, I would have asked, what license are you talking about? But you normally think of driver's license. Right, but it, this, does, this question doesn't, doesn't say that. You agree with that? I agree with that. And like my, in my case, I'm licensed in two states as an attorney. Right. I've only got a driver's license in one. In one. Uh, Objection. We, we stipulate that the, these sections they're talking about say what they say. Okay. I mean, will you stipulate that they're vague? <laughs> no. <laughs> Objection. Well, we won't stipulate. Well, let me ask you then, Mr. Swinson, do you think that that's, those questions are a little vague? Objection. Have you had three or more moving violations or had your license suspended or revoked? No, I don't think that's vague. Okay. Do you know whether or not Antonio Nichols had had three or more moving violations? No, I have no idea. Now, I guess based on that memorandum from Midwest, it appears that he may have had two. Is that what it looks like to it you? It appears, but I don't know that. Okay. And then... The rest of the question is, had your license suspended or revoked? If Mr. Nichols never had a driver's license, do you agree with me that it could never have been suspended or revoked? Why would you ask if he never had a driver's license? How do we know that? All I know is that when I took the application and asked for a driver's license number, they said he doesn't have one. That doesn't mean he never had one. You agree with me, though, that if he never had a driver's license, it'd be impossible for it to ever be suspended or revoked? If that was the case, yes. Moving down policy information, I see where the, the mode of payment, <coughs> we've got four different sections, mm -hmm. monthly bank draft, semi-annual, quarterly, and annual. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't look like any of those are checked. Is there a reason why? No, they sh one of those should have been checked, the monthly bank draft. Okay. <coughs> and then the amount of insurance, it's got 50000 Correct. And then the plan premium, 2713, and I guess your testimony is that that was a monthly premium? Correct. Okay. The next section, 
it looks like it's got actually two different choices, either universal life or term plan. Correct. And this was checked as a universal life option A? Yes. And if you could just explain to me, what does that mean? Option A is that there is a level premium. It will stay at $27.13 if it's issued at that amount. Okay. And what's the difference then between universal life and term plan? A term plan is a policy that is going to cost less money, but it's for a fixed term period, and then the, that policy uh, uh, expires unless it is renewed. Would you agree with me that, that a term plan is, is pure insurance, and a universal plan has more of a, I guess, an investment aspect to it? Correct. And I guess a portion of a universal premium is invested and actually becomes an asset of the owner? Correct. There's another section on there that has optional riders under universal life. Correct. And it's got marked accidental death and dismemberment. Correct. What, what does that mean? If the person died due to an accident or dismemberment of body parts, that the uh, amount being, uh, the amount of the insurance would increase. And how much would it increase? With death, it would increase, it would double to uh, $100,000. Dismemberment, it was varying amounts based on what was dismembered. Okay, like so much for an arm and mm -hmm. so much for a leg? Mm -hmm. Correct. On the next page, the health questions. I believe your testimony was that you went through each one of these with Delania Nichols and you were asking her these questions in regards to Antonio. Correct. And all of them were checked no, except it looks like number three. Correct. Which is uh, any other medical or surgical advice, hospitalizations, treatment, operations, or testing in the last five years. Correct. And that was marked yes. Correct. And then there's a section there at the bottom that basically says if, if you answered yes to any of these questions above. Give complete details. Correct. And it looks like you've got on there, it's under name, Antonio. Correct. Nature of the illness or accident, broken leg. Correct. The, the date started in 2004. The date stopped in 2004. Correct. There was no operation, but he was hospitalized. Correct. <clears throat> and the doctor's name and address was the med at Memphis, Tennessee. Correct. In, in this section, it's the first thing, it says name. Mm -hmm. Correct. Why, why do they have that on the application? Objection, speculation. I, I don't <coughs> know. Um, In health, I understand why it's there, because you're writing a policy for more than one person in a lot of cases, because you're writing it for a husband, and wife, and children, if, if that's the case. In this case, it's only written for one person. I don't know, I don't know why they ask for a name. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I do. I do, wait a minute, let me back up here. This is important, give complete details of any yes answers to questions one through nine. One starts with the health, nine ends up at the very bottom, but seven, parents and or siblings had heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, or any other hereditary disease. If yes, indicate family member illness, age at onset of illness, and if applicable, age at death. That's where you'd have to put somebody else's name under 10. Okay. And that's why they're asking for the name. Okay. On 
on the last page, I think the question they've got is if there's any other life insurance in force with this particular insurer. Correct. And both of those are checked no. Correct. And then the next sec next section it says agent information and signature. Correct. And the question is, do you have any knowledge or reason to believe that the insurance applied for will replace or change any existing insurance or annuity? Correct. And the answer is no. Correct. I mean, is that a question that you're answering? Correct. Okay. Then the next section says, I certify that I have provided the proposed insured a copy of the disclosure for the accelerated benefit, terminal illness, and a numerical illustration. Correct. And I guess, did you certify that, that you had provided Antonio Nichols? I would have provided it to Delaney for that information to go to Antonio when he signed the application. But you agree that you did not provide the proposed insured a copy? Correct. The next section has got, basically it says agreement, authorization, and acknowledgement. Correct. And that is for the proposed insured to sign off and, and to agree to. You agree with that? I look at it that the owner and the insured are agreeing to that because both of them have signed this. Okay. You agree with me though that in order to submit this application to Midwest, you have to have the proposed insured sign where it has indicated. Absolutely. And that section is in bold and has a big X next to it. Correct. And then at the very bottom, right before I guess it gets to where your signature is, it says best time to call for a personal history interview. Correct. And it says 4 p.m.? So it's 6 p.m. Okay, 6 p.m. What is a, a personal history interview? I don't know exactly. I, all I can do is, is surmise that if an underwriter needed additional information that he would call the proposed insured. Okay. He or she would call. Do you know if that was done in this case? I have no idea. Did you know at the time that you took this application that Antonio Nichols couldn't read or write? No. What was the reason that Mr. Nichols was not there when you took this application? And Objection, speculation. His sister had informed me that you know he was in the landscaping business, was out all day and would not be available. Uh, you know, could she give me the information? And I said, you know, yes, you can if you can answer all the questions, but he must sign the application or I can't submit it. And just to, I guess to kind of cut to the chase, you understand the insurance company rescinded this policy. Were you aware of that? I was not aware of that until I got the summons. Okay. That something had happened, but I didn't know what. Okay. And I guess from that memo that I showed you, we've attached it as an exhibit, they're claiming that the subpart A about moving violations and the, and the license was the reason that it was 
Can you answer? Objection. Is that a question? Well, what it says on here is, had we known the client's background history, we would not have issued the policy for the following reasons, but it doesn't say that they're rescinding the policy. Okay. That section on the first page, within the past five years, subpart A and subpart B. Yes. Did you ever write a, a policy where the proposed insured answered yes? Not that I recall, but I can't be sure of that. You personally, I guess in the, within the last five years, from today, mm -hmm. have you ever had three or more moving violations? No. Or had your license suspended or revoked? No. When you were going over this, this policy application, did you, I guess, go over with Delaney Nichols the difference between universal life and a term plan? Correct. And I guess, was there a pitch that you would use or was there a certain product that you would prefer to sell or how did you come up? Well, objection, compound question. Well, let, me, let me rephrase it. Okay. I guess. What are the, I guess, the pros and the cons between a universal life and a term plan? Well, a universal life plan will uh, have cash value attached to it over time. Uh, as you had stated earlier, you're making an investment in that policy. A universal life policy is going to go until and I don't remember the exact ages on it. I know it goes at least till 65, but it may go beyond 65, where a term policy is going to go normally in 10-year increments. And with a term policy, unless you sign up for it in the front, that automatic renewal, at the end of 10 years, if you've got some medical problem, you can't get insurance anymore. With a universal policy, the premium, as it states here, is level. It's going to stay the same. It won't go up. A term policy, even if it's renewed, the, the, the premium is going to go up. Okay. And with universal, I guess, does, it cert does the policy will it get to a certain point where the premiums are no longer paid on it? It can. It, I, can't state that it always will, but it can get to a point where you've got more cash value built up in it and you no longer have to pay premiums on it because the cash value could pay the premiums. When you took this application, do you know what Delaney and Nichols' objective was? Speculation. I have no idea about that. I mean, you know, the mother had suggested that she get a policy for the son. I mean, for yeah, for the son, her her brother. Uh, in my opinion, she wanted to provide you know life insurance for him, with the mother being the beneficiary. And I, I know that. You said that when you quit working in Midwest, you went to work for a funeral home or in the funeral home industry, mm -hmm. selling basically insurance Life products. Insurance. It's, it's called uh, uh, final expense. What we were selling was a policy that would pay the final expenses, the casket, the burial, the whole thing. So what you would do with that insurance is you would figure out, they basically would pre-plan their funeral. 
uh, you know, what kind of service they wanted to have, what kind of casket they wanted to have, whether they wanted to be uh, cremated or buried or whatever. And you would figure out an amount. And then you would, uh, an insurance policy would be issued for that amount. And it could be paid for in one payment. It could be paid for over one year, three years, or five years. And at the end of that period, that policy is paid for. Their, their funeral is taken care of no matter how much it costs. And with that, uh, with that policy, no matter what they answered on uh, health questions, the policy would always be issued. The difference is if there was a health problem, the policy would be issued, but they wouldn't pay the full amount out until after the policy was in effect for two years. Up until that point, all that would be paid is the amount of premiums paid into it. But once you got to two years, if anything happened, the, policy, the full policy would be paid to the funeral home. And I guess what's the significance of two years? Well, the significance of that is so that enough premium has been paid in to pretty much cover the expense, I'm assuming. I don't know why they use the, the two year. It's called a graded benefit. Is, is what that is. And it's also, I guess, have you ever heard the term uncontestability period? Yeah, I've heard, heard the term, yes. And that, that is, I guess, after two years, then the insurance company won't contest paying a claim based on information contained in the application. Correct. The amount of insurance on Exhibit 3, that first page, it, it's 50000 I guess, who came up with that amount? Normally, the, that's determined when you're figuring a premium. You, you'll start out with, you know, are we going to do universal life or term life after explaining the difference between the two. If we determine on, uh, on universal life, it will be, you know, what amount are you looking at? You know, 25, 50, 100. And usually it's determined by what the premium ends up being. And I guess, is, are they in set term or set amounts, like 25, 50, 100? Or could you write a policy for uh, you know, $35,000 worth of insurance? As I recall, it was set amounts, but I couldn't, couldn't swear to that. Was 50000 was that the minimum? I believe 25 would have been the minimum, I believe. And that's for universal or for term life? For universal. Okay. And then what about for term? Was there a minimum? Again, I don't recall. 10,000 seems to stick in my mind, but I don't know if that's correct or not. Did you explain to Delaney Nichols that if any of the information on this application was incorrect, that the insurance company could deny coverage? I don't recall because normally I would just state that, you know, I needed answers to the questions to the best of your knowledge. Do you agree with me that some of these questions, strike that.
do you contend that Delaney and Nichols intentionally misrepresented any of the information on this application? No. Do you know one way or the other whether this information contained on this application is true and correct? And Jack Form Foundation. No, I don't. You know. uh, I'm I sorry, what was the last thing? Foundation. Foundation. Okay. When you got licensed to sell insurance in Tennessee, did you have to take a test? Correct. And I guess, how did you study for that test? It was a class, a three-day class that you would go to uh, prior to taking the, uh, the test that would cover everything as far as the uh, the basic understanding of health insurance and you know what you can and can't do and life insurance and what you can and can't do and then the the uh, legal aspect of it because the test was four parts uh, for two parts for health and two parts for life. I guess did you get any kind of training materials or anything from the state? Were you prepared from, to from the, the school, well, yes. What was the name of the school? I don't recall. Do you remember where you went to take it? Uh, yeah, I can picture the building, but I can't remember exactly where it was in Memphis. Uh, I, I don't recall where, where it was. I just remember it was three days. When you were taking this application, did you give any advice at all to Delaney Nichols? I don't understand what you're asking. Well, as far as, I guess there's a, a choice between universal life and term insurance. I guess, did you explain to her the difference like you did? Objection, ask and answer. Man. I don't know whether there was a, a discussion between the two or if she knew she wanted to have universal life. If she wasn't sure, then I would have explained the difference, but I would not have suggested a choice. And, and why is that? Is there a specific reason why you would not suggest? That's up to the owner or the, the insurer to make a decision of what they want. It's, it's you know, their insurance.
Have you seen the answer that was filed on your behalf in this lawsuit? I don't follow what you're asking. Uh, the answer, it's a formal pleading that was filed on your behalf or that you filed. The answer to what? Uh, the answer to the complaint. To the complaint, yes, I've seen a copy of that. Okay. And is there anything in the answer you want to change or no. amend at this point? Your eighth defense on page eight of your answer states the plaintiffs and the insured provided inaccurate information regarding the health and criminal history of the insured on the application, period. The inaccuracy was material to the risk underwritten, semicolon, therefore Midwest properly rescinded the policy, period. Accordingly, comma, Antonio Germain Nichols was never insured under any policy issued by Midwest, period. And I know I started to ask you about that earlier and there was an objection to form and foundation but I want to ask you about it now. I guess, how did you come to these conclusions? Objection. I don't follow what you're reading from. Okay, sure, I can, <laughs> I can give you a copy of it. Let's, do, let's take a break, I'll make a copy for everybody. Okay. Go off the record, it's 1120. Uh, 